All right. So as I was saying, uh, the today there's no lecture content per se. I am just going to give you guys the breakdown of how the questions are arranged on the test so you know what to focus on. Um, and a few other items. And then I'm going to go through a normalization exercise. So the first thing I'm going to do is go through uh, some of the question breakdown. And it's broken down as follows. Um, and yes, that last one was written like that on purpose. And I will be explaining that soon enough. So what I did is I went through the midterm because I was basically given the midterm because there's seven sections, right? So I was given the midterm and I went through it today. I went through it a couple of weeks ago and I went through it quickly because it was sent to me with a request of, please give me your feedback sooner than later. So I didn't really go through it with a fine tooth comb. And, uh, and then they went out for printing and all that fun stuff. And today I went through it in more detail so I could give you guys a breakdown, which is why we have that bottom category. Um, so when I say general and conceptual modeling, that's questions about what are entities, what are attributes, um, you know, what makes up a proper, um, you know, uh, business rules, that kind of thing. That's what falls under that category. Um, keys, there is uh, five questions about keys. That's primary keys, candidate keys, foreign keys. There's uh, eight questions about normalization. Three of which is literally what is the definition for normalization, and there you're actually picking it from a, you know, multiple choice list. So, yeah, if you know what the definition for normalization, you're going to get at least four points, right off the top. Uh, relationships, entities, and relate and and relations. Uh, that is specifically asking about one and many, many, many parent child that kind of stuff, which is in the slides. Um. Physical modeling, uh, those are the kind of questions of that go along the line of um, if we take a conceptual diagram, we create it for database server X, Y, Z, what kind of modeling is that? Those kinds of questions. Um, and some of them might be uh, questions about a data type or whatever. Uh, database general, uh, there's an interesting question there. Uh, literally, it might be something along the lines of um, which of the following is not a relational database system? And if you remember during the week one lecture, there was a slide with you know a bunch of relational and non-relational databases. If you remember the relational ones, you'll be able to pick up the non-relational one fairly easily. And then there's the, the last category, the WTF. And I am now gonna pause. And what's gonna continue after this is there's also, um, Four short answer questions, you pick two of the four. So there's two short answer ones, one of which can honestly be answered in like two sentences. There is a normalization exercise, which I expect almost nobody will try to do. I'm being honest. And there's a diagramming one where it's very similar to lab uh, three. So you're given a description of some entities and their attributes, and I want you to diagram it. If you're quick at diagramming on paper, it's a quick one to do. Um, it's a total of 75 minutes from start to end, technically 70 minutes plus five minute grace period. I don't understand how that's supposed to work, but so it's 75 minutes. Um, those of you writing in Cal, I'm fully aware you're gonna start writing the test at least an hour and a half before everybody else, because Cal closes at eight o'clock. 75 minutes from seven o'clock is after eight o'clock, so they're gonna be writing a little earlier. If you have not booked with Cal yet, and you require additional time, you should really get on that, because you will not get the extra time in this room. I have 24 letters of accommodation, all of which have different time requirements between two different sections. I have no way to know who has what accommodation. It's Cal's job to take care of that. So if you need extra time, book with Cal. I'll be picking up your exams Friday morning because by the time I'm done here, I can't even pick up the exams because they'll be closed. Um, 
The You will notice when you look at the midterm, there's on the front page, looks like this. There's a spot for a student number, student name, and signature. Student number is pretty straightforward. Signature is pretty straightforward. Your student name, write it with the English letters, please. I can't read Chinese and I can't read Arabic. If you're write, writing a Latin language like French, Italian, Spanish, yeah, I could get away with that one. But when you're using Moon Rune and random characters, bruh, I have no way to know who you are. And it's really, really important because the short answer and diagram is going to be on the last page. So if I don't have your name, you know what's going to happen? I get a test and there's nothing on the front page as an answer. I'm going to go like this. You did not write that test today at all. You get an automatic zero on the on midterm. If I don't know who you are, because what's going to happen, I might get the grade back from the test center, but I have no way to prove you were actually here to do it, other than I had to scan on results. So, yeah, this is very, very important because I don't take attendance because why would I take attendance when I'm getting you to sign it right here? I'm keeping it simple for myself because um, I'll be spending the entire weekend grading 160 exams. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I'm going to do my quick and dirty discussion about Scantron. How many of you have done a Scantron test so far? How many of you have done a Scantron test here at Algonquin? Ha <laughs> ha! There. How many of you have done it at Carlton with their really nice Scantron system? There. They'll even let you do it in pen. Not here. Our Scantron system, they just fi finally managed to get it working on Windows 10. It was running on Windows XP for the longest time. Okay. When you're filling in your Scantron, our Scantron sheets are blue. The circles are blue. That's not a surprise. What a lot of people don't realize is how Scantron machines work. Scantron machines read left to right, top to bottom. And people are like, why is that important to know that? Let me tell you. You're like, oh, question six. Oh, that's got to be A. And you go and you fill in A. So then you finish the test. You go back and you're saying, I'm going to double check. You know, decide to second guess yourself. Oh, question six is not A. It's uh, C. And you did a really shitty job erasing that. Now, Scantron is reading from left to right. Scantron decides that this is just dark enough. That's what you just answered. That's why you want to come in with a good eraser. You can get a good eraser at Dollarama. It's not like you need to go to like Wallach's and get the world's best, you know, vinyl eraser. You can go get one of those nice white jobs from Dollarama and it'll work just fine. Just don't use the pink ones because those are crap. Um, and the other thing you need to know about Scantron, about it being so anal retentive, is this will not scan, that will not scan, this will not scan. This has a maybe 10% chance of scanning. Therefore, what you want to do, man, I made my circles way too big. You're going to fill in the whole circle. That way, Scantron will pick up your answers. I mean, the, the bubbles are literally this, like, they're, they're like that big. So it takes like half a second to fill it in. It's just, fill it all in. Like, don't be lazy. I've actually did get a Scantron sheet where it soon came up with a zero and I didn't know why. And, you know, the week and a half later when I was able to pick them up, they filled it in all like this one. And by then, their final grades had already been submitted. So, because the other issue is going to be is I'm going to get the tests Friday morning. I will drop them off at the test center. I might get the grade results Monday afternoon if I'm lucky. Tuesday, more likely. I have to submit your midterm evaluation during reading week. And then they'll show up available for pickup like a week later. So make sure you do a good job on your Scantron sheet. I will have extras.
in case you botch them, because it happens. People botch them. Um, and the other important thing, which I really kind of peeved with myself because I forgot to grab my Scantron sheets. Uh, and some unknown reason, I cannot find a picture of our Scantron sheets anywhere on the internet. Go figure that one out. There's a section for your name and a section for your student number. Fill them both out and fill in the bubbles. I will be doing my best to catch it. As you drop it off, I'll be looking at them. But sometimes I get like five or six people that all just chuck their shit in my bin and they run away because they're crying. Or they're just tired. Or it's their last test of the semester, so now they're going off to a pub. Take your pick of the reason why they're running out the door. The If you don't fill in the bubbles for your name and your student number, it's going to come back as an unknown student. What grade do you think you're going to get? If I don't know who you are, if you're really, really, really lucky, I'll have one single paper with a name and one single Scantron result with no name. But I wouldn't want to bet on that to save your bacon. Just make sure to fill in the bubbles under your name, under your student number, <laughs> especially your name more than the student number if you're going to forget one. But please do the student number. All you need is your name and your student number and your answers. You don't need to do anything else on that Scantron sheet. Okay. So this is my doom and gloom warning about the midterm. There is, it's multiple choice or multiple guess. Only one answer per question. Like I said, there's two um, questions I found wording a little questionable. The last category. Outside of that, most of the questions are fairly obvious. Um, those of you that have done the quiz for Lab 5 have already experienced some of those questions because the midterm was originally written by the same person that wrote that quiz. So for those that were asking if I have sample questions, the quizzes for Lab 4 and Lab 5 are very close in feeling to the kind of questions you're going to get on the midterm. Is that fair? So you've had an, ex an experience with those questions. I've just kind of cleaned up shop a little bit. Um, I redid the short answer questions. Yeah, you can come in and say it. I don't care. Too shy. Okay, so now that I'm done talking about this, I am going to do my normalization exercise. Um, I'm going to be doing this from start to end, top to bottom. Um, I did this one with the group before you guys, but I used a different version, and I realized halfway through that I did it really stupid. Uh, so you guys get the better version, which is good. Um, we have ourselves a relation at this point. It's not in first normal form. We have a relation. What makes this a relation? There is a value in every column. There's a complete row. And every intersection of a row and a column is atomic. There's not more than one value per cell. That is known as a, re a proper relation. It's not an entity. It's not um, a table. But it is a relation, so it's a starting point. To be in first normal form, we have to be a valid relation. Values must be atomic. And we have to define our candidate key, our primary key. So to, we're going to put ourselves in first normal form. If we look at this, we have a few options. And there happens to be a few overlaps where um, we will actually need multiple keys to make it work. So employee number is probably a given. The rate ID, the combination of an employee and a rate ID is probably not going to work. If I had more data in here, there could be other people with rate ID 3, rate ID 2. There's just four examples. Invoice number. An employee number almost works, but not quite. 
if we take employee number, project number, and invoice number, suddenly we've got something that works because the combination of those three allows us to find any of the three, any of the rows uniquely. So we will pick that as our candidate key, our primary key. So we're gonna go and, uh, oh, come on. That's not what I asked you to do. Well, just gonna underline it here because for the rest of this, it's all gonna be on the board. But I'm gonna leave that up here so you guys have the visual reference of where we started. All right. We all get to enjoy Dan's shitty handwriting all over again. So for 1NF, I am going to put it back on here just so that we have a starting point on the board. And I'm going to just transcribe all my headers over there. So we got employee number. I'm actually going to write bigger once I get past first normal form. It's just I don't have that much room going this way. Employee number. We have a name, email. Uh, I think next is invoice number. Invoice number, uh, project number. Um, I'm just gonna shorten project description, just description, just to avoid. Uh, then we have the hours. We have the rate, ID, and the hourly rate. All right. And I am going to mark off my identifier, which we decided was this, right? Yeah, okay. So here's our table from there in formalization syntax, first normal form. Fantastic. Now I'm going to put a line and we're gonna get ready to go to second normal form. What is second normal form? Can you give me the, the, the official definition of the literature? That's on the test. So what's the definition for second normal form? No, that's still one and F. Eh? No, that's third. What's the other kind of dependency? Somebody said it at the same time as I pointed him. Yes. So to be in second normal form, we must be in first normal form and have no partial dependencies. So what we're going to do now is we're going to identify our full dependencies and our partials. So we'll start with the partials. That one's easier. So the name and the email is probably defined by the employee number. Does the name and the email have anything to do with the invoice number or the project number? No. So therefore it is, those columns are partially dependent on the entire primary key, therefore they're partial dependency. Like that. All right, then we have, um, The description is probably depending on the project number. So that's probably a partial dependency. The hours, rate ID, and hourly rate, when we look at our data over here, you'll realize that it actually depends on the entire primary key. So we have a full dependency as such. So now we have, when we go to second normal form, how many entities are we gonna have? Three, yeah, three. We're gonna have Employee, we are going to have project, and for lack of a better name, I'm going to call it ours. All right. 
and employee was this partial. So we're going to go employee number, name, email. And we know its identifier is employee number. Project, we had project number, description. This is also an identifier. And for our app word, since it's fully dependent, we have to bring in the entire primary key. So this will have employee number, invoice, project number, hours, rate, ID, and hourly rate. Now we know that this is our primary key because that's what we decided up here. And as always, I will also highlight the fact that they're foreign keys just for uh, everybody's uh, peace of mind. All right, so right now we are in second normal form. Yay for us. We need to go to third normal form. And the third normal form, what is the definition for third normal form? Somebody over here said it earlier, but you go ahead. And there we go. So when we look at this, we can actually quickly identify the fact that the name and the email is fully dependent on this and nothing but this. So let's clean this second normal form. It's already in third normal form. So we're just going to say this one's in 3NF for now. If we look at the project, same deal. It's in 3NF. However, when we look at this last one down here, um, we know that the hour rate is defined by the rate ID. So the determinant for hourly rate is the rate ID, but because the rate ID is not participating in the primary key, it's a transitive dependency. Yeah. Yes. Realistically, if it's not depending on the entire primary key, we would have already dealt with it in second normal form. Because that's the point of second normal form is to get rid of anything that doesn't depend on the entire primary key. Because we're getting rid of partials. Therefore, if it doesn't depend on a whole depend on a whole key, it partially depends if for, for second normal form, you're getting rid of it. So when we're in 2NF, there shouldn't be any more partials left. If you have partials left, you you screwed up. I almost said something else. No, no. From 1NF, you identify the primary key. Second normal form, you get rid of the partials. You identify the partials in 1NF, remove them in 2nd NF, and how do you remove them? You explode them out of the entity. Oh. Hold that thought. Battery's dying. Hopefully my audio isn't too choppy. Because I'm doing a way better job this time than I did earlier. Somebody had a question over here. There. This is rate ID. So it's hours, comma, rate ID, comma, hourly rate. So our hourly rate depends on the rate ID, but the rate ID is not part of the primary key. Therefore, it's a transitive dependency. What do we do with a transitive dependency to go in third normal form? Blow it out to its own entity. So as always, we will come over here, 3NF, and we're going to copy everything. This is where we're doing it on, on a computer so much faster, you can go copy-paste. Unfortunately, I'm doing it the long way. This, we have a project. We have... Uh, Let's call it 
rates for lack of a better name. And then we have hours like such. We have employee number, name, email, project, ID, description, uh, rate, ID, hourly. Better answer than such. <laughs> if you think I don't know what that sound is, you're sadly mistaken. You've never participated in a pen and paper D&D &D session during COVID if you don't know that sound. Like that. And now we are gonna put in our primary keys. And we're going to identify our foreign keys like such. And we've gone from that to this. So we went from unnormalized to first normal form, second normal form, third normal form. And I'm going to take pictures of the board because I'm going to continue past this now, because I'm going to diagram it for you guys. And I want to post all the pictures. Therefore, I'm going to take all these pictures. What's the point of a thousand dollar phone if you can't take pictures of a whiteboard? Employee, I'm oh, sorry, it should be employee number. Not employee ID, but because we identified that the employee number, invoice number, and project number, why not call it ID for everything? It's invoice number. I got to take another picture. Um, but because we identified these as up here, so we know that employee number, invoice number, plus project number defined the hours, the rate, and the hourly rate. Therefore, that was the compound key. We brought it down. We cannot break apart a compound key. So therefore, if it was here, it's going to be here. Does that make sense? Maybe a little bit. OK, let's try that again. Like that. Now I'm going to erase this board. And I'm going to start diagramming. All right, so how many entities do I have? Four. So I'm going to need four entities. And we're an employee. Such, and in here we're going to have uh, employee number, and we know that's our identifier. We have a name, we have an email, like uh, we will have our project. And this has a number, which we know is our identifier, and a description. We have our rates. With our rate, 
ID and our hourly this, and then the end we have our hours here, which has literally So we rem we have to remember when we're doing a conceptual diagram, we don't include the foreign keys in the diagram. So we're just going to put in our relationships. Like that. So now we have our relationships have been established. We just haven't set up our cardinalities yet. So I'm assuming an employee can have multiple hours. We know that for a fact, because we got on there. So we know the employee can have multiple hours. Any hour entry only ever belongs to one employee. At most, it'll be one employee. Theoretically, an employee could have no entries because they're on vacation. They just got hired. They just got fired. So that entry is optional. We have a project to hours. Again, it's probably the same setup where this is mandatory, this is optional, and very likely the rates will be the exact same rule. And we would end up with these cardinalities as follows. The, we realize that hours is actually a weak entity because when we look at it over there, it's literally identified all by foreign keys. So we could, if we really wanted to, get fancy and mark it as a weak entity, which means these guys are identifying relationships because the primary key is made completely out of foreign keys. So therefore, this is a weak entity. These are all identifying relationships. So these are all strong entities. Because a project can exist without hours. The rate can exist without hours. The employee can exist without hours. So these are strong. Hours is weak. This is the conceptual diagram that we derived from that data after going through the normalization steps. And I'm going to take a picture of this. And then I'm going to erase the other board because then I'm going to make a physical diagram for you guys from this. Yeah. Depends on what you're doing. The, what I'm doing right now is showing you a starting with a pile of data given to you all the way to the end result. Realistically, there might be cases where you're starting with no data. Therefore, you'd start here. And then do a physical, then generate some data and realize you made mistakes and then start, you know, the process again. It depends on what your starting point is. Did I take my pictures yet? I know I took a picture of that one. You know how bad the glare is on that board? I got back to, I bet you guys know how bad the glare is on that board. All right, so since we have four entities, we will have four tables because we don't have any many-to-many -many relationships. Therefore, since we don't have a many-to-many -many relationship, we're just gonna have the same number of tables as we have entities. If we had a many-to-many -many relationship over here, then every many-to-many -many relationship will add plus one table. Because to resolve the many-to-many, -many, you create an associative or an intersection entity. Therefore, if all you have is one-to-many or one-to-ones, count the entities you have. That will tell you how many physical tables you're going to have. The moment you have a many-to-many, -many, you'll for every many-to-many, -many, you go plus one. That's a fairly straightforward piece of math on that one. So I'm going to start with employee. No, oh, hang on. I'm going to follow my own naming conventions. Okay. Employees. Creating a table. And we know we have an employee number. 
number, we have a name and an email. <clears throat> we know our employee number is our primary key. So I'm gonna mark it as a primary key. In MySQL Workbench, it'll put that little gold key next to it. Other software will actually put in the letters PK. Different software will identify, mark it differently, okay? Employee number, looking at that, safe bet it's an integer. So it's gonna be an int, just like that. Now, name, apparently the decision was that we're just gonna allow the entire name to be in a single field. Cool, let's go with Varkar 100. That should be good enough for most people's names unless you're from Puerto Rico. And if you think I'm joking, I'm not. Varkar 100, email, again, Varkar 150, I told you guys the story why. Never have email less than 150, definitely not 75. We created ourselves an employee table. We have identified our primary key, integers, VARC, and the data types are there. Realistically, we could determine if something's null or not null, but you know, whatever, we don't know what the rules are because we weren't given business rules. So we're just gonna assume everything's not null. So when we're gonna do our rates up here, and we have our rate, ID and our hourly rate. That's gonna be our primary key because we said it was. Again, the rate ID looks to be a number, so integer. Now our hourly rate, even though it's not showing any decimal places, that's because Excel's special that way and it didn't format the data. Anybody who's ever played with Excel knows exactly what I'm talking about. You have to fight with it to get it to show the data, especially if it's a date, the way you want it to. So very likely there's decimal places. I don't see any rates greater than three digits. Therefore, if we want two decimal places, we're gonna use a decimal data type. And it's gonna be a decimal, five comma two. And normally this is when somebody says, can you explain how that works one more time? And I will. So if I go decimal five comma two, actual fact, let me use colors for this to make it easier for people to visualize. Five comma two, this means we can have a total of five digits. So there's our five. I'll get out of the way in a second. There's our decimal place. And here's our two. So if you do a decimal five two, it'll let you hold up to 999.99. And then after that, it'll give you an error. Decimal numeric are interchangeable. They're aliases of each other. MySQL implements decimal. Postgres in, uh, uh, implements numeric, but you can actually use decimal in Postgres and numeric in MySQL and they just swap it with each other. They're the same thing. The red, what, right here, purple. Right, so we got rate ID, PK, INT. Yeah, the orange is PK. Hourly rate here is decimal five two. So we have our rates set up. All right, the next one is project.
We have a project number. And a description. And we know our project number is our primary key, because of course it is. However, looking at our project numbers, what do we see that's special about it? There's a hyphen. Is a hyphen a number? Therefore, what kind of data is it? It's alphanumeric. It means it has everything, including numbers. So whenever you have a string that is is it just a string? Because the second it's anything but numbers, it's a string. Therefore, it's going to be a varchar. And you use varchars to hold alphanumeric. In other words, anything that is not just a number that a human typed in on a keyboard, and it's not a like anything that's not a pure number is probably going to be alphanumeric, also known as a varchar or a car. It looks like the codes are a total of six characters long. They don't seem to deviate away from that. We can probably bet that's safe. We might want to give it just a little more room in case they suddenly decide to throw in one extra digit. So we could use a car seven or var car seven. Realistically, the space impact will be negligible because I mean, hell, what's one byte per row? Uh, but to be good little database designers, we'd use a var car because we, you know, the length is variable, so we'd use a var car, var car seven. And our description. I'm gonna go with var car fifty because it looks like the descriptions are all fairly short. And if they wanted to have more room than that, they could pay us to add another field. You laugh. Well, I've done jobs where we paid by the field. We got paid by the field we added. Now I had two people with hands at the same time. I think his beat you by just a hair. Yes. You could use text, but the problem is text is really painful to use in a UI. Because it, it really, it, it means it's going to be like a text area. You know, when you submit a form, you got a big box where you can type crap in. That's normally a text field. If it's just a single row of text, it's going to be a var car. That's what I was saying. If they wanted a longer description, we could add, you know, complete description and then make that a text. But they can pay us to add that on because it's not part of that spec. Okay. And there was a hand over here, there. I'm going to go with Vartar 7 in case they decide to add one more digit someday. I'm going to plan for the future and assume that just because they gave us this dump with everything is six characters long, that they might have one that's seven. It's better to just add that extra, especially because it doesn't take up any extra. So it's better to add that extra space if you go Varkar 7 just, just to be safe. Same reason why we have Varkar 150 for the email, because they might have a really long French name. A, a double is overkill. Do you need infinite decimal places for money? No. Even if you're talking about inter, uh, exchange rates and international, international transactions, the standard in Canada is three decimal places of precision. A lot of companies go to five. Because anything past five, realistically, that precision is lost. So, yeah. There's another question. I think I saw another hand. Yeah. Well, it depends on how you decide to store it. That's your choice. I've seen it done as an integer, where it's always, you know, 1%, 2%, up to 100%. The problem is then you could do 1,000%, which is possible, um, but not on a discount. So then you'd use a decimal, and I've seen people do, you know, uh, four comma one. So it'd be up to 100.1, like 100, they could do 999.1, which is still a thousand percent. But by the same token, you do a hundred percent discount, or you could do 90.5% or 50.5 or whatever. That's, that's 
actually part of the discovery process with the business managers. Or right, when you're interfacing with a client, they go, okay, well, what kind of percentages do you guys use? Do you do discounts? X, Y, Z. Some people will actually do like uh, numeric uh, four comma three. So that they can do 0 0.755. So they can give 75 and a half, but they don't want to do the multiply, divide by 100, then multiply. They just don't want to do that one extra piece of math. It depends. That one's very um, ambivalent. Percentages is weird. Uh, but yeah, you could do a decimal uh, two com uh, 3 comma 1. That lets you do up to 99.9% .9 discount. Then somebody say we need 100%. Then you end up having to do 3 comma 1. So then you can do 105%. So it gets a little loosey. Uh, it's just some it's literally decisions as part of the discovery process. You'll make a decision as part of the discovery process, then you will add it to the diagram at this point based on what they said and what they agreed to. That would be a business rule. All right, and we'd have our last item, which is hours. And in here we have employee number uh I swear I've lost something. Invoice number. I lost the invoice number somewhere along the way. I lost the invoice number. How cool is that? And I've erased the board, so I don't know where I lost it. Cool. And nobody here caught it either. We're all very tired. Holy crap. Fantastic. I botched it somewhere. I knew this was going too well. Was it? Okay, thank God. Okay. There. It's been resurrected. Uh, somebody's playing too much Baldur's Gate. Right. ID. Project. Number. Invoice. What the heck am I writing here? I'm writing in... Invoice number and hours. Okay. Good times. Primary key, primary key, primary key, primary key. Good times. However, we also have foreign key, foreign key, foreign key. Like such, because the invoice number was part of ours. It doesn't come from anywhere else, but it is part of the primary key. Therefore, this is a weak primary key. And we just need to put our, our data types. Yes, that's what's throwing me for a loop. Yes, you're right. Okay, I got the right rate ID, which is a foreign key. My brain's starting to melt. Foreign key. So I got... I'm going to reorganize it so it's easier to read. Okay, we have the project ID. Project number and the rate ID. And this is going to be, therefore, actually, this shouldn't be identifying. Uh, 
and these two are foreign key. That's a primary key. That's a foreign key. And that's a foreign key. All right, now we put in our data types. Now that we've stopped making a shit show out of this. Integer, var car, seven, integer. <laughs> Invoice number looks to be an integer. Cool. The last one we have left is hours. Again, they look to be whole numbers. Theoretically, a lot of companies bill by the half hour. It's not unheard of. Uh, depending on the billing cycle, is this a weekly bill, a monthly bill? So we don't know how many hours a person could work on a project. Very likely they could work over 100 hours in a month on a project. <coughs> so we'll probably use a numeric or a decimal so we can handle the half hours. And we will want to um, give ourselves one decimal place and allow up to three digits of time. So we're going to go decimal uh, four comma one, and that'll let us put in, you know, a hundred and five hundred hours and half an hour. So one hundred point five hours. Uh, different companies build their time quite differently. Like the company I work at, at least pre-acquisition, uh, we build by the day. We did an hour of work for you. We charged you for a day. We worked for seven and a half hours and two people were working on it. We charged you for a day. The reason we, that we had that kind of pricing structure was, let's say I worked on something for an hour. My one hour might've involved two hours from the project manager and an hour from the OEM sales rep. Therefore, even though it was just one hour of work, it might have been a total of like four or five hours of actual different people working on it. So we build for one hour because it's got to go through multiple hands to get there. We build by the day. It worked for us. Some companies don't like billing like that. They don't find it honest. We thought it was pretty honest. We told them we were for an hour charging for a day. We didn't even pretend that we were uh, hiding anything. All right, and then we draw our relationships like that, like that, like that. And now that I didn't lose my invoice number, it makes so much more sense because I was going through this. I'm going, I feel like I'm forgetting a step. And I did. Um, just brain fart. And in the end, this is our end result. We have, uh, we went from a table of raw data to a physical design that can actually take all of the data that came from that block of text. And this was probably the most stealth review any of you have ever experienced. Because I just covered every topic we learned this semester. While well, doing an example. It's a much more practical way to learn the concepts because you're actually seeing them in practice, not just, you know, words on a, on a PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, basically what I just finished doing is basically what the midterm's about. <laughs> What's your name again? By the snort, that was not your name. <laughs> By her snort, that's not your name. What's her name? <laughs> I don't always, I don't remember people. <laughs> nice. Okay, you have a, do you have a real question? Yeah, it's a foreign key. So it's not participating in the primary key here. It's just a foreign key. I, I I lost it. Yeah, that's because I I when I did it, I lost it by underlining it. It shouldn't have been, but now it was too late because I already erased it. I can't. I'll Photoshop it out of the. Yeah, I'll Photoshop it out of the screenshot, the the, the pictures. Um. Yes.
this is my second time doing something like this today. So my brain's starting to get, you know, I feel like I've already done it before. So it's starting to skip steps. But the problem of doing this, this lecture back to back, it gets a little, um, the second one's a little deja vu. Yeah, yeah, it's very Groundhog Day. So this is all the topics for the semester. This was your stealth review by actually showing you how it's all done from start to finish, uh, including witnessing how what to do when you screw up um, and owning up to it, because it's important to own up, that, to admit that you screwed up. Um, this also gives you an idea roughly, you know, what things should look like on the assignment, because there's a conceptual diagram. There's your physical diagram. I mean, that's two thirds of that assignment I just did on the board with you guys. Just, it's not the data from any of the assignment. I did that by mistake one year. Where I had an example for the board was really, really close to one of the scenarios. And I'm like, oh, that was bad. Um, but it is what it is. Outside of that, that is it, folks. Uh, if anybody has questions, I'm ready to field them, but I'm gonna stop recording now. Um, those of you that feel comfortable, you can just bail, go home. <laughs>